This is the Trout Bitten Podcast. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten? Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten? Yeah. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten. It's about trout. Wild trout. This is Trout Bitten. This is the Trout Bitten Podcast, and thanks for tuning in. My name is Dominic Swantoski. I'm the owner of Trout Bitten and the author of TroutBitten.com. All right, welcome to season 13. We're glad to be back at it, and we have a great fall season of podcasts for you. Tonight, our topic is why we catch trout in patches, in groups. Catch some here and catch some there. And I have the Trout Bitten crew here with me, and we'll dive into our discussion in just a moment. So we've been doing the Trout Bitten Podcast for three years now. And after 130 podcasts and 1.3 million downloads, we've published 169 hours of this podcast. (laughs) Yeah. And that's that stood out to me. Because for reference, there are 168 hours in a week. (laughs) Okay. So you get my point, right? We've covered a lot. Uh, We've gotten way down into the weeds about many of our favorite tactics. We've done overviews of trout stream insects and then gotten more detailed with follow-up podcasts that got into specifics about caddis, for example. We did an overview of night fishing that was so popular that we ended up recording a full skills series on the topic that spanned five episodes. And I know we all felt like we still didn't come close to fully covering night fishing. Uh, Matt and I just experienced the same thing with the dry fly skill series. In seven episodes, we both know we left a lot on the table that we didn't have time to discuss. Now, years ago, my friend Steve asked me a question that I'll never forget. When Trout Bitten had published for a year or so, I was writing articles at the time. Uh, Steve asked me, don't you think you'll run out of material? And I remember sincerely being confused by that question. But I thought about it for a moment, and I replied with the easy answer. No. No, we won't run out of material. Because fishing keeps happening. Because each of us keeps learning and changing. Because we fish another river, or even the same river, and so much seems to change. There's no end to this game. And I know that's one of the things we all love about it. So in these three years of podcasts, we've shared stories talked about family and friendships, aired our grievances with the fly fishing industry three times now. And here's one of the coolest things. I think this podcast has tied all of us together in a way that just fishing together could not have done. And I'm thankful for that. So each season has a theme at Trout Bitten. And for these fall and early winter podcasts, we'd like to hold casual conversations for these episodes. In the past, we've set out to break down the details and share strategies or argue opinions, often laying out a framework with the intention to hit all the major and minor points, uh, being careful not to miss anything. But tonight, and for all the episodes in this season, I think we'd like to build off of that. We've already shared how we like to fish. Most of you are longtime listeners now who already know many of our preferences, our quirks, and our tendencies. And with that in mind, these conversations will hopefully have some inherent depth that really could not have been possible when we first started the Trout Bitten Podcast now three years ago. So there you go. That's the plan. We have some of the season's topics in mind, but I don't think I'll share them here because honestly, we want to stay flexible and keep things dynamic as the season goes on. But we have 10 episodes for you, and we'll finish up right before Christmas. All right, then here we go. Let's introduce the Trout Bitten crew. Now, every year at the start of the fall episode, we've kind of reintroduced everyone. So guys, will each of you share a bit about yourselves and how you became connected with Trout Bitten? Let's start with Dr. Trevor Smith. Mister, hey. how you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. Doing nice. very well. Just shot a buck. Just shot a buck, yeah. <laughs> he shared Indeed. the picture with us. Yep. So that's exciting. Always good to get that done. Not a bad buck. Shot it right in the heart. I'll brag yep. for you. <laughs> Shot is that the goal? Heart. heart or lungs? I think the heart is ideal, but it also sits low in the chest cavity. Mm. So if you're aiming at the heart and you miss low, you don't have a lot of margin. But a lot of people will aim at the heart because if the deer is going to flinch or kind of jump the arrow, mm. it'll drop. And so if you miss the heart high, you hit lung. So it's a pretty good aim point. And if you can hit it, great. Quick kill. You got it. 
Welcome to the Mediator Podcast. Welcome. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> we can always use a little more hunting content in here. I know. What about yeah. you, Dr. Trevor Smith? How do I get connected to all you jokers? Yeah, I suppose. Right? <laughs> Real quick. Yeah. I grew up in State College, Central PA. And when I got out of, I was in the military for 11 years. And yeah. when I got out of the military, I moved back here to town. One of my Air Force buddies came with me and wanted to go fishing when we got back here. So I hired a guide to take us out because I didn't you know. feel well equipped to show him the ropes while I was trying to get back into it myself. So we went out with, with this guy named Dom yeah. and fished and spent a day together. And at the end of the day, exchanged contact info and just kind of left it that, hey, maybe we'll fish together sometime. We hit it off and yeah. enjoyed kind of similar things about the water, I think, similar things about the experience. Right on. And sometimes you just kind of know when you meet somebody that, hey, I think this could be an enjoyable friendship. There you and go. Neither of us uh, played too desperate, but we, <laughs> we start, started fishing together. I didn't play hard to get. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> and now we have back porch beers. Mm -hmm. Now we have back porch beers, yeah. yeah. And then Josh and I kind of met separately. Um at the same church. Hmm. So, well, let's introduce Josh Darling yeah. then of Wild Media. It. Everybody kind of knows Josh, but I say everybody, that's not true. And we have plenty of people that are just kind of learning about the Trout Pitting podcast. Josh, tell people a little bit about yourself, please. Just almost everybody. Almost. What's happening? Uh, I mean, so I think Austin and I went to school together. And so yeah. we. Spent a ton of time. We used to do these things that we called trout vacations, where we would, uh, I'd get a text from him early in the morning, be like, "Hey, what do you think we? What do you, what do you say we don't go to biology today and we go fishing instead?" And we yeah. would do that relatively regularly. It was not good for our biology scores. Um, no. <laughs> so we fished together pretty matter. often. He started ta telling me about, you know, he was the one that introduced me to the mono rig, and I didn't really know a whole lot about trout bitten, but he showed me some of the articles. I'm like, this is least intriguing and then i am catching more fish this way and then uh what well, we went to we went to happy valley he yeah. invited me out to just uh come and watch you and ted and renee playing back in your music days and so i came there we hung out listened you and i got to talking we talked yeah. about some design work for trout and uh, and then we emailed a little bit of back and forth after that fished a couple times i showed you where i catch all the big ones and <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and that was kind of the, the start of it. And I, I was wondering I, who told him about that. I told him yeah. about the trout and superfly. That's mm, why you yeah. got the big ones. You showed me the fly. I showed you the streams and all that. <laughs> and you and I have been working together pretty much ever since, right, Josh? That's right. Love it. And now you own a farm. That's right. That's no joke. You, no, you know, it's how many horses? Uh, four. And a bunch of acres. Lots of acres. Got mm -hmm. your own hunting grounds. Mm hmm We got goats and chickens and cows. And I love it. We got everything. When we go here. past your, your area, uh, my boys say, hey, there's Josh's mountain. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's pretty cool. So how about Billy Dell with the 20 ouncer over there? <laughs> 20 ouncer orange can. Because a pounder isn't big enough. Huh, yeah, Deli? 19.2. 19 <laughs> Is that are you serious? <laughs> that's what it says. Oh. These are smokestacks. These are bigger than the pounders. Okay. I know, I know. It should be 20. <laughs> it should. It'd be, it'd be even. We hey, you got to get closer to the mic. A lot closer. There, I knew you were going to do that. I know. <sighs> Deli. <laughs> Deli. It's been, it, what a layoff. This is what a layoff does to guys, right? It makes them lazy. I know. All right, here we go. We'll try hey, again. Hey, there he is. More better. There you go. Um, Deli, how'd you get hooked up with uh, trout pitting? So I ran into Matt Grobe on a river around uh -oh. here. And uh, we started hanging out and fishing a little bit. And then the jerk moved to Montana. Yeah. And so uh, I started fishing with Burke a little bit. Yep. And then started fishing with you. And Burke and I were telling you how to catch fish. And so you could write articles about it and stuff. And then <laughs> <laughs> that's how Trout Benton was born. Yeah. <laughs> that's nice. Walmart beats. Yep. And I rock Walmart beats. <laughs> He's got his blue Walmart beats on, and he didn't get close enough to the microphone. Anyway, we're going to move on to uh, Matt Grope. 
OG, baby, OG. OG. Uh, <laughs> you, can't, you can't say that here. It's all right. We need a beep. Season 13, we need we need everybody, all the new listeners to understand what's up. Yeah, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's uh, dangerous. Grove's the dangerous one. All right. Sometimes uh, Dom has to edit too much of my mm. verbal communications. Takes me time. Yeah. But yeah, OG. OG, yeah. old school, man. It yeah. was, uh, I don't even know the year, right? Back, all I know is. Uh, we're, we're nearing t- 10 years of trout pitting. So you and I met like 12 years ago. Uh, if not longer, I bet. Yeah. Right. yeah. 13, 14. Uh, 13, 14 years already. Um, back in the day where forums were a thing. You know, mm-hmm. I don't think forums are, are, are too Reddit prevalent these days. Reddit? Uh, Just Reddit. Yeah, Reddit. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, one of our mutual, well, what ended up being the connection to Trout Pit was Mr. Pat Burke. See? Uh, who, who Bill the keystone. alluded to. Um, he he kind of has his hand in a lot of these uh, friendships. But he was, uh, I would say, big fish fanatic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> back when it wasn't even cool to catch big fish. When um, was that? When when wasn't it cool to catch just, big there was, fish? There was definitely a time where the uh, grip and grin gained steam, and I think Pat was like evolutionary in uh, the grip and grin and pushing that along. But that guy was... Uh, he has a hold. It, he yeah, has a he, hold that is that has taken off. Yes. Sure, sure. And yeah. w- when he uh, figured that out, Social yeah. media kind of blew up, right? That's true. Um, and true. you know, he went on a. Uh, he was he was a fanatic for catching big fish. Uh, earned every one of them, right? Hard mm-hmm. hard work. Right. Did yeah. no did a setups. lot of right. Did a lot of research. Um, and uh, trolled people. Um, from a distance. <laughs> and true. at the time, I I had been lucky and was getting a couple good fish uh and he tracked me down and i you know i blew him off a couple times because i was like who is this dude and no i'm not giving you any of my spots um (laughs) but after persistence i I, i'll never forget i went to uh a central pa limestoner and met him and uh at that time you couldn't share your location with your wife because you had a flip phone and uh, I was like, Mindy, <laughs> here's where I'm headed. I'm meeting this guy that keeps bugging me, and she thought I was psycho. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we met at a river, floated, and kind of the rest is history. Uh, you know, and he, and he talked about a group of anglers that was, uh, you know, mm-hmm. eager and driven and loved talking shop. And, uh, you know, I, I want to say at the time, uh, Dom, you were, you were quite – uh, it was quite challenging to break into the oh yeah to the forum right. So yeah. I think I was the first one to 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 break in the original true. the the original original uh, yeah. uh forum and so uh, got true. the invite on that and the and the rest is history and met met some lifelong fishing friends and um you know I'm 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 out here in Montana now as as mm-hmm. Dell said um. And I brought one of the OGs with me. Old old Slooper is down the sloop or uh, down the street uh, from me. So we got a little trout bitten influence in Montana. Yes, you do, because Sloop is uh, before you, right? Yeah, yeah. He's he's really. I mean, that guy's even. He might be before Pat. He was man. He's the right. I mean, he's the trout bitten. The, the he coined the term right. I know right. <laughs> the original of the originals. Yeah. Is it, it it's a weird thing with fishermen, right? That you talk you see, you know, you talk to somebody online and you're like, Hey, let's meet up and go fishing. Yeah. And if you tell someone else like outside of fishing that you're gonna do that, they're like, What if the guy murders you and cuts you up into pieces? <laughs> like good point. They're good point. like it is such a weird like outside of fishing, it is so weird when people when you tell people that story, like I met some guy on the internet and I went and met him and we fished for <laughs> the day. Like it's people are like, What? No, no, that's you know, not weird. Nah, it's not weird. No, nah, trust me. It's okay. <laughs> I can say I've never done that, actually. I, I'm way more uh, private, I suppose. <laughs> I don't want to have any. I don't want to meet random people. Okay. <laughs> so our buddy Austin Dando isn't here tonight. He's uh, kind of got the dream job, and he's uh, he's on the road. I think he was in Louisiana. He's in Alabama now. 
he's got a few states he's traveling to. When he comes back next week, we'll pick his brain about uh, the job that he loves. A little bit of travel, and he's working from home when he's not traveling, so he's in uh, he's in good shape. <laughs> I just told mm-hmm. you guys. Uh, he showed up on my front porch, and we uh, shared a beer. And I said, man, you look good. So he's 30 years old, and uh, <laughs> he can still do 30 chin-ups. Oh, Right? That's his Impressive. thing. Every year for on his birthday, he tries to do as many chin-ups as he is old. And at some that's point... That's a good goal. It's, gonna, it's a good goal. But when he's like 35 and he can only do 35 chin-ups, he's going to feel really bad about himself and then he's going to die. He's going like to spiral. An, you know, <laughs> an early... <laughs> that's right. <laughs> It'll be an early death. You go, ah. Oh, I, did, I did 30 chin-ups and cracked five beers. Right. It happens. <laughs> yeah, there's a beer quotient too. Hmm. Right? <laughs> you got to be careful of that. Yeah. Since 2006, Yeti has been building products for anglers who fish hard and share an addiction for the woods and the water. Yeti changed the industry with their legendary coolers by featuring rugged but simple designs built to last for generations and stand up to whatever Mother Nature might bring. Yeti now takes that same functional and elegant design to everything in their lineup, from soft coolers to drinkware, bags, and more. The new Yeti Go Box gear cases have become my daily storage solution for a life on the water. Offered in three sizes, the Go Boxes are rugged and waterproof at home on a boat or in the back of a pickup. All Yeti Go Boxes offer smart storage solutions with removable cargo trays and dividers. And the Pack Attic is a set of zippered pockets conveniently housed in the interior lid of the 30 and 60 sizes. Lockable, light, and nearly indestructible. I use the 15 size Go Box for camera gear and the 30 size for organizing my reels, fly boxes, leaders, tippet, and everything else that keeps me fishing. The Yeti Loadout Go Boxes are the perfect angler's companion. For over a decade, Smith Creek has designed and built outstanding gear for the serious angler. Smith Creek's rod rack is the perfect solution to store up to seven pre-rigged fly rods safely inside your vehicle. Each kit comes with two heavy-duty suction cups and three mounting methods. If your vehicle has bolt holes in the rear headliner, Smith Creek now offers free M6 eye bolts with your proof of purchase. The Smith Creek rod rack has been my choice for rod storage for the last five years because I prefer to keep my rods in the vehicle, rigged up and ready to go without the need for a rod vault on the top of the vehicle. All Smith Creek gear is backed by outstanding customer service, no matter where or when you bought it. To stay up to date on their latest specials, follow them on Instagram at smithcreeknz. Quality you can depend on from a brand you can trust. Smith Creek. Hey, let me mention this. Listener questions. Uh, So we won't cover any listener questions tonight because we've spent a little extra time here on the intro. But let me quickly answer something that I hear a lot. Uh, Many people email me and say they don't know or they don't see any form for submitting a question for the podcast. We're not that formal here. Um, There isn't one. There's no form. Uh, I don't think I'll add one either. We get a ton of questions that come in through email, through Instagram, and through YouTube. And those are all good ways to submit a question for the podcast. Do that. That's formal enough. That works. Um, you can find my email address at the end of every Trout Bitten article. Or you can use the contact page on the website. Thanks, everybody. You guys ready? Let's do it. Yep. Yep. Uh, why do we catch trout in patches? That's our topic. Uh, you guys know what I mean, right? You get to the end of the day, you look back on things, and you can tell the story about how you caught three in that one spot and then nothing for a while. Then you missed two and landed five in another spot. You had three at the best undercut bank and another handful at the tail out. But in between, there are often some longer periods of inactivity. All right, guys, do you see that as well? I hope it's not just me. Uh. I guess I'll I'll clarify it. Here comes Deli. Yeah, I kind of agree with you. So when I fish streams that have high densities of fish, nice. I think that's a fair assessment at times. But yep. when I fish streams that aren't as heavily populated, I feel like that's not necessarily the case. That's cool. That's cool. That's a really good, like quick distinction here, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, everything's relative. I also feel like it depends a lot on the type of stream I'm fishing because some streams truly have like 
they have good habitat and they have pretty barren stretches, you know? And yeah. so if I'm fishing upstream as I hit the good stretches of habitat and structure, I might catch four or five fish. And then I go through a section that is low yield, but it's worth fishing, you know? So mm -hmm. I may not catch anything for a little while, or I just want to kind of try out different tactics and throw streamers through a flat or something like that. Low yield, but it accounts for those patches. Mm -hmm. Those low density streams that Bill is talking about are in a way more, it's, it's more comforting when you experience days like that because, because you're like, well, there might not be fish right there. Yeah. And some of our streams that we've got around, it's like, no, there are. There, right. I mean, there are fish behind yeah. every every major rock and every major seam is going to hold fish. Yeah. And so when you experience pockets of fish and, and, and dead zones, it doesn't make any sense because then you're walking up the bank and you're spooking fish off the edge and you're like, well, like they're here. I fished that. Why yeah. are they only eating in certain areas? <laughs> I know. Yeah. You guys are bringing up a really good point. I mean, it has, it has a lot to do with how many fish are in the stream. Am I fishing over fish you know and i've said before i've i grew up in western pa and it was mostly stocked waters and that has a lot to do with it too did they stock this um did it get fished out Be, you know did people keep every trout they caught am i fishing over fish but if you know that you're a, that you're fishing on a high density stream like you said bill if it's high density and there's fish basically behind every rock then things do change. And if you're fishing a high-density river, and there should be a fish behind every rock, or at least, let's say, a fish or two should be seeing every presentation that you give. Like, on almost every cast, there's a fish or two seeing your fly. Then it makes you wonder, like, well, still, like, why am I catching a fish or five in this spot and then I didn't catch anything for a half hour. And then I caught another three or four. And then I didn't catch anything for 10 minutes. And then I caught another two or three or four. You make up your own numbers. The fish density thing is very important. Because sometimes you're just finding fish. You're finding where the, act, where the fish are. But let's put it this way. Obviously, I guide. You guys guide for trout bitten as well. In Pennsylvania, if they list it as a Class A wild trout stream, you don't need a guide. You don't need anybody to tell you where the fish are. They're everywhere. That's what a Class A wild trout stream designation really means, is that there's trout almost everywhere. Now, where are they feeding? Like, that's the thing to figure out every day. Like, what water type is the most productive? Then, then you got to try your, your tactics and your presentations. But for the most part, if it's a Class A wild trout stream, and if there's fish almost everywhere, then you can trust that fish are seeing your fly on almost every presentation. So then you can't really use, let's say, the excuse of like, well, I caught four back there because that's where the fish were. But then sometimes in not class A wild trout streams, but in, in places that are lower density, like you said, Bill, then that really is it. Like, okay, I found the trout. That's why I caught fish. That's why it's so hard to talk about this stuff. Yeah. I don't know about you guys, but I often think when I have my setup, you know, I'm at the at the rig and I gear up for the day and my tactic, you know, is whatever. Let's say it's nymphing. I, I find the prime lies, you know, a little bit of moving water, pocket water. Yeah. Those are the places I'm looking for, right? And as I work my way upstream, let's say I did get into a patch of fish in that incredibly productive yeah. holding water. And there's a, you know on the, the yeah, we're on the front end of an insect hatch and you just know those nymphs are active and things are working well and then you get into the tail out or deep water and maybe that tactic you know their fishes are there but maybe that tactic just isn't the right tactic right. for that 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 tail out leading in you know maybe you get another 75 yards until you hit that right. pocket water so if you were to fish all the water in front of you and change tactics, right? To me, that's a little pat. Like maybe I did then fool the one fish that's in the tail out, but maybe he wasn't on those nymphs because they aren't emerging at the tail out of the pool, right? Maybe he's looking for crawfish. I know. Right. And so then you patch, bam, there's a patch of I caught one fish. And then I go back into the, the you know, the 75 yards up river. I wanted to fish the whole river, picked off one more sipping the first emerging duns. Hmm. Go back into the, you know, the head of that riffle 
and smoke five or six fish that are still on those nymphs, right? That to me is like, is reality and why I think you get into the patches sometimes. Yeah. Well, what you said, like everybody, everybody has experienced that in dry fly fishing. Mm. And, and I think that they just forget that that the same stuff happens underneath the water. Like we all experience periods of like prolific hatches where the trout will concentrate their attention on one area. And when we can see it, there are flies all over the place. But the same thing's happening under the water all the time. Hmm. And hmm. so you you find a you find a patch or a zone where there is a, a hatch happening and you're gonna find the the trout even if you don't see that hatch. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Some of the practical reasons you may also hit patches are just I think sometimes we're not as adept at changing our own tactic and style for the water we're fishing. And so if you're if you're fishing and you're not really adjusting tippet length or you're not adjusting your weights for the different speed of the currents in different yeah. regions, yeah. you know, you may be really well suited for the pocket mm-hmm. water, but not for the the tail out or not for the deeper run that you fish. So depending on how you want to fish, you know, I think if you want to dial in each water type as you move through it, you mm-hmm. may be able to find more success as you do that. But it takes work to do that. Uh, Trevor, what you're talking about right there is something mm-hmm. I've been thinking about for about, I guess, the last five days. I kind of decided a few days ago, let's, let's talk about this. Why do we catch them in patches? Because it happens all the time. Yeah. And so I've been thinking about this for, I mean, like five days. And I fished three out of those five days. To Bill's point, like, there are fish everywhere. These are Class A wild trout streams. Mm. Yeah, out of those three trips, I fished three different rivers. And they're all class A wild trout streams. There are trout. I feel like there are trout looking at my flies on every presentation. Mm -hmm. So Trevor, to what you're Mm -hmm. saying, I like to believe, I I do believe, that there's something I could do to get those trout to agree with me. Yeah. In every spot. I just need to make the weight adjustment or if I'm on a dry fly, I need to make the pattern adjustment. Mm-hmm. Or maybe skitter it or hop it or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. If I'm fishing a streamer, then there are, oh gosh, I feel like there are 50 things I could do. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say 100, but there are probably 50 things I could do with a streamer to convince those trout, like, you should eat this. Yeah. You know, and that's that's what's fun about it. When you know yeah. the trout are there, when you know that you have a class A wild trout streamer, just come on. I mean, there's fish in there. Then that's what's fun. It's like, mm-hmm. go get them. Mm-hmm. Make the adjustments. To me, that, that, that's the most rewarding thing about it is when you catch j- not just one in that spot, but you, you, okay, you catch one, you net them, you release them, great. And let me go get another one. Oh, three casts later, I got another one yeah. on the same presentation. Oh, and I had just before that, you know, I be, before the first one, I just changed my tag fly and both fish ate the tag fly. That's great. Or maybe both fish ate because I was, you know, doing a speed lead on a streamer. That's great. Now you got two fish that agreed to your terms. Mm -hmm. I would say like one fish is luck. Two fish is, eh, maybe you got something. If you have three fish that'll eat the same presentation, I feel like you're starting to have some kind of hard data. And of course, if you get four or five, six fish that'll eat the same thing, but they didn't eat the other thing, when you were kind of A-B testing, when they, when they looked at your other flies, but they rejected them, and now they look at the B flies and the way you're presenting them, and they eat that, like that's good data. That's fun. To me, that's what it's all about. A-B testing and trying to find multiple fish that will eat that same presentation and not really accepting that, like, God, ah, they, they just won't eat. I have two thoughts. So the first, yeah, uh, water level. I think water level plays a huge key Cool. as far as, you know, if you're fishing a river, if half of it is, you know, almost to the point where it's like four or five inches deep, you're not going to have those patches mm. closer together. Where if you have more water, the patches of fish and the more productive yeah. water could be closer together. Good point. Um, yeah. the other point, I guess, is I, I disagree with your point. A, well, mm-hmm. a little bit with if, you know, three, four or five fish, it's a pattern, but it may not be the best pattern to catch like the next level fish. Like I've had days where mm-hmm. I may catch, you know, 20 or 30 fish that are like six to 10 inches. 
-hmm. but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the, you know, that's the best pattern to catch the most fish, but it may not be the best pattern to catch the biggest fish. The biggest. Yeah. Dom, you comp guy. (laughs) (laughs) Just going for numbers. No, I catch seven, eight inch fish all day. We've seen, we've seen the videos. We know they're six or eight inches. Just going for the smallies. I think one in, uh, interesting. I like what you, I like where you were going with your point, Dom. About in every particular area where there are fish, there's something that you can do to get those fish to eat. And I think another interesting question would be like, whatever makes trout reject food or like a natural, you know? Mm. And what is it, you know? Like because we've all seen flies drifting down a stream past trout without being eaten. So what is it about a particular situation that you think is, what what variables exist that would cause a trout to bypass or or to let food drift by it? Because I feel like trout in general, wild animals, can't really afford to forego opportunities at food very often. So mm. what is it that we're missing when we're trying to target those food forms that you could also see causing them to skip over something that was natural? Mm. I guess I think it's if they're in a, let's say, a non-feeding lie, they're not expecting any food. And so they're not necessarily ready or willing mm. to eat something. I mm. like that. So mm-hmm. like, let's say they're eight feet down in a hole at the bottom. and Eight feet is a lot. It I just is. want to point that out. That's a that's that's deep. That's deep. Let's say you're on a, a really deep river. Yeah. And so you're trying to fish that eight. You know, if you got a fly down to that fish at eight feet, do you think he would eat it? Or I guess to me, I feel like that fish is down there because he's not interested in eating because he's you know, I um um sleeping. He's in a sl- not a sl- yeah. He's taking a nap. Oh, what's the word? Oh man. Walmart Beats is that the yeah, resting? Yeah, Walmart Beats. <laughs> <sighs> he he. I guess he's in a sheltering lie. Fair enough. Is the is the word I was looking for? Or like if he's like four feet back in a root ball, like he's not gonna come out and eat something. Or if you put something near him, he's in, you know, that sheltered lie where he's not interested in eating. Mm-hmm. So I th- I think Trevor, it's a it's a cool thought, right? Like to understand why uh, mm-hmm. there's there's different complexities to the to the river, but just like fish, I think insects congregate in certain areas of the river too, right? So if you're fishing a slow, mm-hmm. long section, and you guys, you've seen maybe adults floating by, but maybe they're not emerging in that type of water; they're emerging yeah. in the riffles. Mm-hmm. Those fish are going to follow food form. So if you're you know, finding the, th- catching the three to five to six fish on that one pattern, you know, at the head of a riffle, it's because of that insect is really concentrated in that area. But if they're yeah. in the six foot deep hole, maybe they're foraging on scuds on, you know, algae that's resting at the bottom of that pool and you're fishing the, the mayfly nymph and that fish is eating scuds. I mean, we look at the diversity of especially streams around you and me and how complex yeah. the insect yeah. evolution is throughout the day. You could have the fish underneath the uh, vegetation that's eating the beetle in the midst of a sulfur hatch, right? Um, and you're throwing the sulfur nymph. And so, of course, he's not going to eat that because he's looking at his prime lie. You know, everybody has these micro living environments on a river. Um, and think about it. You know, it, within a two mile stretch of river, how complex is the hatch cycle? One, you know, you could have emerging insects at the beginning of mile one and at the end of mile three, the hatch might be over. So they're focusing on something different. And I've seen that, right? And, and, and I think that plays into why, you know, different fish in the river eat different insects at different times. Yeah, just different things happening on different pieces of the river and it doesn't have to be a mile away. Right. Yeah. It, whatever. It could be 50, 50 feet away. Right. Yeah. But it can cause us to be patchy fishing, right? Like mm-hmm. that right alone on. can cause the patch. Right. And you got to figure it out in that spot. And, and, and the trout are agreeing with you. Yep. And, you and you go 100 feet up, and all of a sudden, nope, that's not what they're eating. Yep. 
Whether it's after a fishing trip or at a backyard fire, you can bet the Trout Bitten crew has a case of New Trail Broken Heels along with us. It's honestly our favorite beer. This hazy IPA is smooth and full-bodied. Hand-selected citra hops lead to notes of bright clementine and juicy ruby red grapefruit. Broken Heels is a keeper. New Trail Beer is proudly brewed in Williamsport, Pennsylvania and delivered cold to your favorite craft beer retailer every week. At New Trail, it's not about being the best angler. It's about getting out there. So enjoy nature's moments and reward yourself for a day well fished with New Trail Broken Heels. It's Trout Bitten's favorite beer. The landscape is changing for trout anglers. No doubt you've already noticed another truck at your favorite access point and seen more anglers on the water. For those looking for new challenges and fishing opportunities, Trout Routes has the data to help you avoid the crowds and explore new public water. Trout Routes has mapped more than 50,000 trout streams across the country with curated detailed maps of public land and access points. Trout Routes has developed integrated and interactive data, putting the tools in your hands to research new water and help you navigate in the wild to know exactly where you stand in the current. It's still up to you to find those deep pools and undercuts, but Trout Routes helps you get on the water, connecting you with resources like fly shops and stream gauges for trout water across the country. Download Trout Routes in the App Store today. Then use the code TROUTBITTEN for 20% off your membership at maps.troutroutes.com. And we talked, Dom, about it a little bit in the dry fly series. With right, the, we did. With boat fishing. I know. A little bit. Boat fishing, to me, I get into patches more so in boat fishing because you're covering that much more water and getting into these different cycles. Yeah. And, and you really have to think, okay, well, I was just crushing them on a caddis pupa up there. <laughs> I know. Right? Right. Like, what? And then all of a sudden, it's like, whoa, whoa. I started seeing heads pop. But because I didn't make that change, you know, my patch, I, I caught them in patches. I was there for, mm -hmm. you know, right know. right place, right time. And you can get out of it real quick, especially in a, in a boat. <laughs> I like to think that we could just keep it going. You know, yeah. all right, <laughs> class A wild trout yeah. stream, fish almost everywhere. If we made all the right changes mm -hmm. at all the right times, we could sure. just catch a fish every five minutes. There you go. Yeah. Maybe more. <laughs> it feels like part of the problem is like, I, it's like we kind of go into like autopilot a little bit and we okay. just sort of assume that, assume that what's working in the last spot's going to work. And hmm. when we're talking about things like A-B testing fair. and stuff, yeah. like, mm -hmm. but that relies on you being completely intentional and aware and I present know. for every little bit of water that you cover. Yep. And I, I mean, like on a good day, maybe I'm, I'm like that, but half the yeah. time I'm like, I hit a spot that I really want to hit. Yeah. And then I keep waiting up and I'm thinking like, you know, the, uh, how are the kids doing with the school thing? And I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> fishing, but I'm like, but I'm like on aut autopilot, you know, yeah. like I can, yeah. I can fish through a section and then like not even realize I fished through it. And then, and then all of a sudden I get a hit and then locks me back in. And then all mm -hmm. of a sudden I'm catching fish again. And it's like, maybe mm -hmm. the problem wasn't that the fish weren't eating, yeah. but I was just on <laughs> autopilot. I wasn't really mm -hmm. there. That's a fair point. It's a good point. Yeah. When you rig out for the day, I guess for me, you have you you're making two. You're making a decision. You're either going to choose to fish all the water types, or you're going to mm. fish a specific water type. Right on. Yeah. And try to you know, okay, I'm set up to nymph two to four feet of water, and so mm -hmm. I'm going to walk by anything that's not that to try yeah. to focus on that. And you know, sometimes during the year, that's the best tactic. And other times mm. it's, it could be the worst tactic. And mm. so to, I guess, to consistently catch fish where you're not like in those patches, um, it just takes time and it just takes experience. And every day is different because maybe, maybe it's that the, the best method is to fish a dry fly at the tail out of every mm. pool. And right. so you're going to go do that versus go to the head of it and nymph it. And so, just knowing the river, knowing the insects and all that, like it's, yeah, it's everything and understanding all of it and then putting yourself in the best, the best place to succeed and eliminate like the patches. So Deli, if you catch, I don't know, five, six fish in 10 minutes or 15 minutes um, in two feet of water that's moving really fast, for example, and you catch them, I don't know, down in the strike zone with a nymph, are you going to go 
let's say you run out of that kind of water, that that's done. You caught like every fish in that piece of water, in that spot. Are you going to go look for another piece of water just like that? It depends on the day and depends mm-hmm. on the size of the river. Okay. So and how many if, people are fishing? <laughs> yes. That's ex- true too. That's a, <laughs> so if I know that I, if I walk a hundred yards and I know the river, there's a spot that looks just like this and it has the same water yeah. type yeah. and I'm going to walk that hundred yards or maybe it's a half mile. I got to walk a half mile to find mm-hmm. that next spot. Um, it depends. Like some days I have the motivation to do that, to say, okay, let me skip over all this water that right. probably still has fish. But in my gut, I know that if I want to catch the most fish or the best fish, I need to move and do that. You have, you know, some days I'll do that. Other days I'll work that, like you're saying, maybe it's 20 feet of river. And you you work everything you can out of that. And then you say, okay, well, you know, I did good there. And the next level is kind of a flat tail out. And yeah. so maybe I saw two or three fish rise. And, hey, that's enough to satisfy me because, hey, I just mm-hmm. caught six fish out of the last run. I know. I want to throw up. I want to throw a dry fly now. I I'm know. tired of throwing nymphs. And so yeah. I'll fish a tail out. And I may not, I may, maybe I'll catch a fish doing mm-hmm. that. But, and you're okay with that. Yeah, but that's like the the trade-off, and it just depends mm-hmm. like what you consider success that day and what, what you find the most enjoyable. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, and listening to Bill talk about that, you know, and maybe the different tactics, you know, right off the bat, we're so spoiled with some of our waters. You know, when you think of them, there's, you don't have to walk far. <laughs> On we're on a lot of them, right? Like there's right, just right. killer there's just water, fish everywhere. After killer yeah. water after yeah. killer. How water. do you want to catch the trout? Right. Sometimes but instead of how do the you sure. know, trout want you to catch them? That's <laughs> yeah. being spoiled. But I would say yeah. even up there, I can think of one of one of our you know maybe lesser pressured limestoners up there. There's sections so where you really gotta walk, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, there's a lot so of limestoners okay. out there, but you you would know the one where, well, that I'm talking about, where there's chunks oh. of that river, mm-hmm. right? That you got to walk to get into fish. Where if you go to, you know, maybe one of the other ones, where you know there's ten miles, you can just keep walking upstream, and there's a good run and a good run and a good run. Very limited, right. poor water, um, you know. And out here, same. I mean, there's you know sections that are just it doesn't matter. You know, I tell people where should I go fishing? Doesn't matter. Just pull over. That's it. You don't have to worry about it, dude. Just pull over. Just start right. fishing. <laughs> like I said earlier, you don't need a guide to tell you where the good spots are. No. If there's a bunch of fish in there, then mm-hmm. it's like, f- start where you are comfortable. Yep. Catch a couple fish and then right. start to try to dial it in. Sure. And then like Deli said, you can decide like, oh, okay, you know what? I got them dialed in and the strikes on down in two feet of water. But you know what? This tail out looks nice. Let me see if I can catch half as many fish, but in the tail out on top because I just want to. Sure. Mm-hmm. Do you guys feel like there's a certain time of year uh, where the patches are less in duration, so to say? Like the the patchy fishing is more relevant than than others Mm -hmm. yeah i feel like less patchy would be in like major hatch season because you could have bugs at the head of the run you could have bugs at the tail of the run that are coming up and so there's also going to be bugs in between that are keeping the fish active Mm. and versus i don't know let's say winter where they might have a specific lie that they want to lay in or a water speed or water type that they're looking for that maybe there's only 5% of the river that they're feeding in that day. Yeah. And so I guess that's, that's where you have to say, okay, well, it's not worth my time throwing that dry fly at the tail out because there aren't any bugs or there there isn't anything coming up. And so then I, I, then I know, Hey, I got to, you know, I am going to walk the hundred yards or half mile to the next run because I know that it's, you know, kind of a waste of time if I fish between those two points. Nice. Yeah, no, I like that a lot. I think I agree. I mean, I, I totally agree with what Deli's saying, with especially the winter stuff. Um, you mm-hmm. know, but I I'll often find myself, you know, once you learn to, depending on what your knowledge level is of that river, um, yeah. you, you can often find that those, those fish school up 
you know, at least out here, we get a heavy congregation of winter lies in deep, slow holes. And I could argue the the you, the fishing's less patchy because I'm hammering a hole, you know, mm. for for two hours because there's a pile of fish in it, right? So, <laughs> so that, you're in the same, yeah, you're in the I'm same spot, patching. but you're. I'm not going. No, it's <laughs> it's no, there's no gaps in your patch. It's what my name <laughs> is tonight. <laughs> <laughs> oh That's no! What we call I'm it. Not, I'm not repeating that. Yeah, you should. We, we can't share that, Matt. You're so belligerent. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you guys this. I was thinking about this a lot too. Do you think sometimes fishing seems patchy because we're spooking trout? Like, are, are we spooking trout ahead of ourselves? Let's assume that we're working upstream, whether we're fishing dries or nymphs or or streamers, and we're working upstream and we're staying behind the fish, but We've talked about this before. I call it the Paul Revere effect. <laughs> like you spook one fish that you know you almost step on, and he goes and tells everybody else. He goes, he goes running upstream, and he's like, "Hey, they're coming! <laughs> that fish, that fisherman's coming!" And he spooks everybody ahead of him. But maybe you're able to catch a two or three, or maybe even four trout before that Paul Revere fish goes and tells everybody. Deli, you got something? I mean, I had, I had like the Paul Revere stocky fish, like. <laughs> Um, that's the worst like two weeks ago where i was you know i was probably 30 feet from this fish and yeah. it, it was like in the middle of my back cast yeah. and then it just took off and then it i just it was like one at like it was super gin pearl, clear pearl, stream pearl, pearl. and it was it yeah. was like fish going <laughs> everywhere and i was like well now i gotta walk another 50 yards to the next hole yeah. because this one's dead yeah well stockies really seem i mean do you guys agree stockies kind of group up Often, anyway, especially yeah. the more freshly stocked they are, the more they want to be right beside mm -hmm. the brothers and sisters. Like they definitely group up, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. and and usually they're more forgiving, and that's why I was yeah. like, man, this is really bad if I'm spooking stockies at thirty feet. I know, and then you're in trouble because, like yeah. you said, you got to go find the next patch of stockies, <clears throat> which is why we like wild trout. Because, like we're saying, I mean, a class A wild trout stream or whatever your state calls them, there's trout everywhere. And you're mm -hmm. just trying to find where where they want to eat and what they want to eat. And that's that's a fun game. But sometimes yeah. more fish leads to spookier. If you think about it, if there's 20 fish in a hole versus two fish in a hole, mm -hmm. there, if there's more fish in that hole, there's more chance of spooking something versus, mm -hmm. a, you know, maybe a lower density stream would fish better low because there's not as many eyes on you. Nice. And they're more spread out and you can screw up one spot, but then <laughs> yeah. go up 10 yards and get the next spot. Sure. Yeah. When we're talking about our holes, like some of our holes are only like two foot by six foot, you know, like good that's point. what we're talking about. Right. And, that's a good distinction. And so if you notice that you're, you're catching fish in the holes or the runs that are, you know, 40 feet by 10 feet, but you're not mm -hmm. catching fish in the holes that are you know, two foot by eight foot, then it's like, yeah, there's, there's a decent chance that you probably are spooking fish mm -hmm. because that water surrounding that's all shallow. And if you're, if, if you're doing fine when you're moving into the deeper stuff where the fish are going to be more comfortable and less, less afraid of you and your presence. But as soon as you walk through the skinny stuff and up to a hole that's, that's small. And then, then I think, I think it's super realistic to say, uh, if I'm not catching stuff in the in the places that the fish should be, but is smaller and surrounded by skinnier water, but I am catching fish in the in the places the fish should be that are huge and aren't going to be as affected by my presence, then there's a pretty good chance it is you. I like that. And not only are you doing the Paul, you know, can you do the Paul <laughs> Revere effect, but so can the guy around the bend that you're not seeing. That's right. That's, good point. That's right above you. And you know, let's let's face it, streams. They're not straight. You can't see a football field long of where no. everybody's at. And so, you know, there's a lot of stuff that, that can happen to, um, you know. Oh, yeah. Get fish, you know, hiding or, if you know, yeah. being affected and cause the patchy fishing that you're not even aware of. Right. Deer jumping in, an eagle coming down and, you know, picking off a fish or just threatening Lighting. to pick off a fish. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Thermal, like, thermal stuff. Sun. Some guy with a drone. Uh, 
<laughs> some We've guy, been that guy. Some guy from Wilds Media with a drone <laughs> spooking all the fish like he's a heron. We, flew, we accidentally flew right up on a guy once. <laughs> I was like, we're like getting some footage. <laughs> like, what is I was that? like, oh shoot, that's a guy right below, right under the drone. <laughs> Whoops. Sorry My about bad. that. <laughs> Imagine you're fishing and here comes a drone right in your face. Probably, you were probably at 20 feet from him. Is that yeah, fair? 20, yeah, maybe close. 30 feet max. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, whoops, sorry about it. That's funny. <laughs> I think what surprises me the most, um, again, on these wild trout streams, is that there are groups of trout, and I mean small groups of trout, maybe 10 fish that seem to be eating the same bug in the same way. And maybe I feel like I'm lucky enough to fi- kind of figure that out in this spot in this one spot where there's 10 fish, I catch three of them and miss one. Then I move on to the next spot that seems to be just like it. And they're like, nah, we're not eating that way. Sometimes I think I'm making too much of that. You know, maybe I give the trout too much credit. And I should just move on to the next spot because maybe a heron did just, you know, pluck off one of those fish and, and spook the rest before I came around the bend, like you said, Matt. I don't know. The longer I fish, I guess the like the more questions I have, the more I doubt myself. Instead of having more confidence, I, I, I feel like I doubt myself even more in some ways anyway. Well, and you've experienced success a certain way. And if that's altered, right? And and that could play into what, why you're second guessing it, right? Because yeah. you may have done certain tactic back in the day that's produced X, Y, and Z, and all of a sudden now it's a little harder. Things have changed. Streams changed. Right. There could be a million different reasons, but we're into the, oh man, my patch fishing is real. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so how do I get out of that? And you want to keep, you don't want, want the patch fishing, right? We want consistency. That's um, a good point. Right. You'd rather have, right. Like patch fishing kind of feels like, all right, I figured out that one spot, but then I had this half hour in between or 45 mm-hmm. minutes or hell, two hours in between you know, in between action. And sure. you, it never feels like as much success. Let's say you catch 15 fish at the end of the day. And I personally would rather catch a fish every 10 minutes. And 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 I go, oh, I got 15 fish. Well, I had it going all day. Good for me. Rather than I got 10 fish here and five fish there. <laughs> and then there was three hours in between. You know, that's that doesn't feel like as good of success. Am I right? I, agree. I mean, do you feel Yeah, no, I agree. Because I feel like it, it sort of makes you feel like your skills aren't as versatile as you'd like yeah. to think they are, right? Nice. That you, you're you good at one thing, but you're not good at... I think the ultimate is being able to truly meet the trout on their terms in every particular situation as you evolve right. up the stream. But like you said, there are variables that you could be unaware of. And so you always have to keep that in mind. And I think that's why you could probably take the fun out of it if you truly are trying to just mm. judge all your success by the rate at which you catch the fish because if you get that um you know that stretch where a heron is spooked fish or another person is spooked fish if you're spending all your time worrying about the fact that you're not catching fish in this section you're probably you might be missing something but still i do think it's one of the things that keeps us all coming back to fishing for trout in this way is that i mean we've been doing this for so long and like you said dom despite years and years and years of getting better at this, in some ways you feel like you're almost starting over again. I know. You know? Mm-hmm. It's like if it was easy and if it was easy to figure out what they were doing in every section and we had easy success all the time, I don't think it would be as no. addictive or as you know alluring to, to keep trying. For me, excellent polarized lenses are a critical piece of gear every day that I'm on the water. Tajima Direct has changed what I see in the river. Tajima Direct offers top tier lens replacement services with the best polarized lens technology on the market. They offer both prescription and non-prescription lenses so you can upgrade the lenses in your favorite frames with purpose-built lens tints that are specifically developed for fly fishing. Tajima's patented technology cuts glare and enhances clarity like no other lens that I've worn. I especially love their low-light specific yellow-green 40 polarized lens, which is perfect for early mornings, late evenings, and the cloudy days that we all enjoy so much. Tajima Direct offers excellent service and the best lenses on the market, along with much better pricing than your local eye doctor can offer. Clear vision and more detail 
with less strain so you can see more fish. That's what Tajima Direct delivers. Visit Tajima-Direct.com. That's T-A-J-I-M-A-Direct.com. Upgrade your lenses and see what you've been missing. Precision Fly and Tackle is a family-owned business with a passion for the outdoors and a sense of adventure. They are anglers who enjoy every moment spent on the water with family and friends. Precision Fly and Tackle carries the widest selection of Euro rods, reels, lines, leaders, flies, and accessories. From the beginner to the advanced angler, Precision Fly and Tackle can outfit every angler, no matter the budget. Visit them online at precisionflyandtackle.com. Then use code TROUTBITTEN10, that's the number 10, for 10% off your order. Gear up with Precision Fly and Tackle for your next adventure. I'd like to have a 50 fish day every time I'm out, but then again, mm-hmm. I guess not. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Right? Yeah. I mean, if, it's, if you're catching 50 fish every time, like, why are you still going out? What's the point? Mm-hmm. That's bluegill. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Right. You got a pond you can fish, catch 50 fish every day. There you go. <laughs> At least you got a pond. But um, I guess I've gone through confidence challenges where I feel like, like you're saying, like, hey, I, I feel like I should, you know, I caught five fish in the last run. Why haven't I caught another fish for the next, yeah. you know? And so, I don't know. I guess at this phase, I've just kind of assumed that, hey, I either need to move on because I've spent time in that, like the next run right. and said, okay, you know, this looks similar and I'm just going to, you know, change flies and whatever. And at the end of the day, a lot of times I feel like it's a waste of time for me, mm-hmm. like to just, okay, I got to the next run. I fished it the same way. I fished at the same speed as I did the last run mm-hmm. and I didn't catch a fish. Okay, well, let me move on. There was something that happened in this run, like you said, a bird, a deer, you know, something disrupted the fish or maybe they're just not feeding in this run because it looks the same on top, but maybe underneath it's not, I'm Mm -hmm. missing something. You know, if it's, if it's towards the summer, maybe there's not enough springs or something underneath that don't necessarily lead the fish to stay in that run where, and I guess same thing in the winter, right? So the springs could be keeping it warmer in the, in the winter versus the next run. It looks the same on the top, but if you were to take the temperature at the bottom of that river, maybe it's three or two degrees difference. And that makes a lot, that means a lot to the fish at that time. Mm-hmm. If you guys had to rank the tactics that are more susceptible to the patch fishing, if you were just kind of what Deli said, rigging up for a specific technique, whether that be streamers, dry flies, nymphs for the day, is there one of those that you feel like you're more prone to patching patch fishing and are you okay with it because you kind of expect it that's a cool question my knee-jerk reaction was streamer fishing but i was trying to then think like how many times do i really catch fish in batches with streamers right right. i feel like it's more not sparse right right so yeah yeah so i feel like nymph fishing and maybe even dry fly fishing yeah um Uh, so i feel like where you're yeah deli so streamer fishing i feel like you can adapt to the majority of the different water types or at least in my mind i can right slow water tail out fast water i can adapt to that dry fly fishing you also can i guess based on there could be if it's a caddis hatch they could be they could be in the faster head of the water versus okay. if they're olives they could be at the tail of the water mm. you know and then somewhere in between you know, you got terrestrials, you could throw them off the bank the whole way through there. And so I feel like it's a revolving door of different seasons. Like nice. each, each season I could pick a tactic and say, Hey, I have the most confidence to fish through this and have the least amount of patches. Della, you got good answers. I was thinking while I was off. <laughs> <laughs> he was uh, on his layover. He was, he was thinking when he was in Glacier National you know, Park. He's teeing him up. Fishing. He's teeing well, right? him up. Yeah. Well, I, I, I wasn't fishing, but I was thinking about it. I was, he was I in was Glacier. Stu- the Dick Jones, you know, yeah. method. Right, right. Uh, virtual fishing. Yes. Dick Jones, vir- virtual fishing. As soon as Delhi came back from that trip, I sent him an article mm. that I was like, I'm probably going to spook Delhi 
was sending this article. We, we, Deli, we never talked about your reaction to that. You were you were on the same hiking trail, and ten days later, people got mauled by a grizzly bear. Uh, was that oh. the which one was that? <laughs> he was already out of there. Though. I was, I was, you were out, but I just made you know it. you're pretty sensitive to the bear situation, aren't you? Yeah, I don't know. I guess <laughs> being I guess being there and being around people and mm. talking to people, um, I guess but made me has- less sen- le- made me less sensitive, but I still okay. was quite like alert. Where uh, like, yeah, alert. I, yeah. Like it there were there know. was no patches in your uh, alertness. <laughs> no, there was no yeah, no, there wasn't. He's like, I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> His head's on a swivel. <laughs> yep. Hey bear. <laughs> hey bear. Hey bear. Hey bear. <laughs> Did you wear a bell? Did you wear a no, bell? No, so a Bill Bell. I, I heard That's I cow he, bell. Bill Dell with a bell. So Dinner bell. What I've heard, I did, I did, uh, I did the research, and it says the um, the the bear bells they call dinner bells because oh. the the bears are actually intrigued by that noise and will actually come to it. <laughs> human, another human. Yes. That's what the Let locals know tell there. the tourists. Yeah. yeah, the dinner bells. Tourists first. Oh, that's Sacrificial funny. tourists. Wear this bell. We here, walk here. down the trail. Scared these. It's like how I put <laughs> peanut butter in Sleep's backpack. So, right. hey, uh, here's a bell. Uh, Tell the tourists, put the bell on. They'll, they'll scare <laughs> the bears away for us. <laughs> the um, I did run into this guy from Canada. It was from Alberta, Canada, who mm-hmm. hiked 15 miles in jeans. And it was like 85 degrees that day. And it had it literally had a bottle of water and hiked 15 miles. And he was, yeah. That's old school. on. Yeah, he, he was, didn't need he all the bad. specialized gear. He was badass. He was didn't just, need a camelback. Nope. <laughs> right? <laughs> he didn't he need a camel. Jeans. Literally had a like a bottle of like Walmart water of twenty ounces. Good for him. And good for him. He was like in, with no bear spray. Just he was going to fend him off with uh, jeans. Hey, bear. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, I'm bringing it back. I'm bringing it back, Matt. Bring it back. I think that dry fly fishing is the patchiest. Hmm. Obviously, I nymph a lot too. And yeah, nymph, nymphing can certainly be pretty patchy. And I think streamers is the least patchy, I would say, because of what Trevor said. I mean, I'm not expecting to catch a whole bunch on streamers anyway, and I am covering a bunch of water. I'm not expecting to catch five fish out of one spot on a streamer. But I feel like I can sometimes catch three, four, five fish out of one spot, mm-hmm. 10 by 10. Right, let's just put a number on. What is one spot, Dom? Ten feet by ten feet. Uh, maybe I can catch five fish out of that on my best day, uh, but not on streamers. And on dry flies, man, yeah, maybe I can catch all five because they're actually eating up top. Mm-hmm. But then I can go a half hour till I find that next patch. Yeah, I feel like it's a big ask. We talk about this a lot. What are you asking the trout to do? Well, on a dry fly, you're asking them to come from the bottom where they're holding clear up to the top and that's a big ask and and when you get one fish that agrees to your terms there's probably a couple more because they're i don't know let's hope that they're following insects to the top and they're actually looking for that profile up top and so yeah i feel like dry fly fishing is the patchiest for me i agree yeah i i totally agree with with that and i would also say that when it's when you get the dry fly fishing that's not patchy yeah it's that's some of the the best fishing of the year right when you're not that's fun when you're just you know charging with dry flies only it's small we talked about that last season but um yeah and i would say that nymphing is you know because there's so many variables with the dry flies early morning you know maybe not be the best but nymphing you can kind of roll that tactic pretty confidently from sun up to sun down. Right on. I think the patchiest fishing I've experienced is when I'm holding a camera and hoping for Dom to catch fish. (laughs) That's a big patch. (laughs) Really patchy. (laughs) That's good. Anything else, guys? At the end of the day, I think we could all agree that patch fishing is just part of of the game when it comes to fly fishing i think we all experience it um and and maybe you know 
what we've discussed tonight is some things to contemplate when you're getting into the the patchy time of day or or type of water you know maybe we gave everybody some some different stuff to think about but it's definitely part of uh, a day on the water unless you're frank naylor (laughs) hey uh dr trevor smith will you read us out i will Remember, the Trout Bitten Project is a free resource for all anglers. Oh, the Trout Bitten yeah. website hosts over 1,500 articles, videos, and podcasts with endless stories, commentaries, tactics, tips, and more. Mm-hmm. Find what you like through the top menu and through the search page. Navigate by way of the categories and tags, too. Be sure to find the Trout Bitten YouTube channel, now featuring the Trout Bitten Tip Series, Fly Fishing the Mono Rig, and the Trout Bitten Fly Box, all in collaboration with Wilds Media. Also, check out the fish and film videos in the new Riverside series, all featured on Trout Bitten YouTube. Yeah. Thank you for listening to the Trout Bitten Podcast. Please give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and leave a comment, because that really helps. Hey now. Until, until next time, friends, fish hard, enjoy the day, I spooked and em. find your life <laughs> <laughs> on the water. Hey now. On the water. Hey now. I went, hey now. He goes, oh, oh. ho, ho, ho. Oh, you're wrong. Yep. He Paul revered me. <laughs> I gotcha. Yeah, I gotcha. <laughs>